So what can we do to be safer? So as with all of these cases, whenever you come across a case, you can dissect it in multiple different ways and try and think about how you can reduce the frequency of that happening, but also the severity of that happening. So the case I was involved with over the weekend, the practitioner did an amazing job um, and was very aggressive with how they restore the blood flow. So lots of hyalase we used. I think we got to 24, 1500 unit vials of hyalase that we used over about 24 hours. Um, and this is partly why I think she's got a really good result. There are other cases where you can tell by the case report they've put far less in and actually got necrosis as part of one of the outcomes. So um, you've, you've got to look at that in this way. Now, we, don't, we never know for sure because every vascular occlusion is so unique, but I always try and pull out a couple of things that potentially have done differently uh, may have averted the severity or the frequency of that type of injury. So from a frequency point of view, um, each time you inject, you're taking a risk with a vascular occlusion, but um, what can you do each time you inject that decreases that risk? So one of the simple things, which I've always been an advocate of, is aspirating. Now, aspiration is not 100% effective, and sometimes that's used by some practitioners to say, there's no point doing it at all. Um, my argument would be, even if it only works 25% of the time, you may reduce 25% of the chance of a vascular occlusion. It's actually around about 50% in some of the papers I've seen I've certainly had many dozens, if not hundreds, of, of positive aspirations back. I suggest you do that before every injection, particularly when you're doing large injections, large volumes. Um, the next one would be thinking about the anatomy. Where is that blood, blood vessel least likely to be? Now, all three of these cases were reported by the clinicians to be at the periosteal level. So these are injections are deep. In theory, the artery is meant to be more superficial. Um, but obviously, you do get little connections, and, and sometimes the anatomy is different. And we never know for sure in the, in the case reports exactly where the needle was at the point of injection or whether there was, for example, the towering technique. I, I still see people do that, um, which is when you start at the periosteum, but you become more superficial to get more projection. So all of these things might affect the risk a little bit. Going back to aspirating for a second, it's really important to know your product. So um, I'm quite aware that not all products will aspirate, and sometimes that's used as a reason to never aspirate. But actually, why not just get to know the individual products that you inject and the combination with the instruments that you use? So if you're using a 27 gauge needle with juvenile voluma, I've tested that. I know that it aspirates, for example. Um, but you might use a 30 gauge needle with juvenile ultra 2, and I know that doesn't aspirate. Now, knowing that changes how I inject on different days. I may, for example, not prime the needle uh, if I'm injecting a big injection uh, onto the periosteum with a product that doesn't aspirate that well because then I know I get one aspiration which should be sensitive. Um, other things you can add on is when you do aspirate, start with very low pressure. So I've, I've seen it said that if you pull back quite a lot, I saw a paper that reported on this, that you may suck the vessel wall in. And that's certainly been my experience as a junior doctor that if you suck hard when you're trying to take blood, you don't always get anything out and you actually need a little bit of finesse at the beginning, a gentle first stage of your aspiration and then you're likely to get a few flecks of blood, hopefully, in some of those cases, and that may prevent you getting a large vascular occlusion. Um, you can also just aspirate between boluses. So if you're, if you're doing a large augmentation, you know, some of the bigger ones might take four or five mils, why not separate it into stages? Now, you're not, gonna, you're not necessarily going to decrease the frequency of vascular occlusion, but you may decrease the severity of the vascular occlusion. And I'm increasingly thinking in certain parts of the face that severity is more important than frequency. I would rather have five superficial vascular occlusions on a nose, for example, than one big one that causes blindness, though, if that's the ratio. Now, obviously, I'm trying to decrease frequency too, but there's something to be said for being particularly cautious with large boluses because when it does go wrong, it's much worse than the smaller ones. So um, that's something to think about as well uh, with these larger volume injections in the lower face. With this presentation of normal capillary fill, but the pain, what would you normally want to know next? So we have to kind of figure out what could potentially be causing this. And really the details of the procedure make a really big difference to where your diagnostic mind goes. So where was the patient injected? When was the patient injected? What product was used? What depth of injection? What instrument were used? All of those, in my mind's eye, start to develop a pattern of potential risk. And unfortunately, we didn't actually have any of those. I think if we'd known exactly where the patient was injected, it may have been a lot easier. 
to immediately think of where this potential injury was. Because this is a confusing situation, patient in significant distress, but with a normal capillary refill. So um, the examination internally was really where it all started to come together. Why do you need to know all those things to rule out a complication? It's more the detail and the focus that you'd put into play if you know how the procedure's been done. So if, for example, you know that it was a treatment in the lower third of the nose, that's a different pattern of risk than the upper third. You know, the upper third, you have that the, it's from the internal carotid blood supply, so there's a higher chance of causing blindness and injury to, to that, that part of the facial blood supply. Whereas in, if you're in the lower third, you have the injury to the internal structures of the nose are a bit more likely. Uh, and that immediately should shift your attention. So um, l tip lifting might might hint at a different pattern of injection, injection than removing a dorsal lump, a dorsal hump, for example. So what happened next? So on examination of the nose internally, um, it was revealed that there was a serious injury to the septum. So it looked like necrosis to the septum um, linked to this non-surgical rhinoplasty. And uh, this explained why there's so much pain, but also why the capillary refill on the outside of the nose is normal. Uh, and that's obviously where we tend to focus after an injury, a potential injury. Um, but the blood supply to the inside of the nose is different to the blood supply to the outside of the nose. So it was possible to have normal capillary refill on the nose externally, but internally have a severe necrotic injury. So does that mean then that we need to start doing capillary refill tests within the nose? Um, it's certainly what you should be doing if your patient presents with pain in that area. So probably the biggest take home from this this whole journey is to think internally with symptoms and signs and not just to look at the outside of the nose if you have treated someone with a non-surgical rhinoplasty and they complain of pain. Pain is very significant in most procedures. We may have a bit of discomfort, tenderness, but pain, you know, especially a lot of pain, uh, you should always see your patient and exclude serious injury face-to-face uh, -face, rather than assuming from a WhatsApp uh, video, for example, that the capillary refill is normal and therefore all they need to do is wait. Apart from the redness, how is this presenting differently to other VOs? So I think because it's a pressure sore, you get a much more diffuse boundary to it and because obviously the pressure is diff diffuse. So it starts as a high pressure point where you put the most product and then it will fade as you go more laterally. And it doesn't follow the path of major vessels. So you'll often see with necrotic injury with noses, you know, it tracks up the supertrochlear artery and you even get the forehead affected. That's clearly an intravascular injection. Whereas with pressure on the nose tip, it, it's, it's bright pink at the tip and then kind of fades laterally. So that's one of the things. And I've also seen this in, the, in a chin uh, which also felt quite taut. So I'm, I'm wondering whether this is actually something that happens in other places too. Never seen it in a cheek or a lip. Um, but th th those areas where there's tightness and noses are particularly that way, particularly if there's just a capillary blood supply in that area, I think it's more likely. Anywhere else we're getting these pressure necrosis? So I think I've seen one in the labella as well. And the difference was that it was it followed only the track of where the filler was so if you use a higher g prime filler which if you actually read the package most of them are contraindicated in the labella so that you shouldn't ever inject them but people do um you you might compress the arterioles um in the surface or the capillaries just in the in the papillary dermis so what that would mean is you get a localized very very localized area of necrosis and you get a line where the filler was that basically it's red around the outside and effectively necrosis with a very small area that scars. It's not a very big type of necrosis. Now that's very different to injecting the supertrochlear artery where you'd normally see the whole forehead be occluded or even worse, cause blindness. So it's, it's I believe, more likely to be just in the, in the dermis, compressing capillaries and then causing small amounts of necrosis. So what are the risk factors for this particular type? So I think Injecting anywhere where the skin is taut and the, the tip of the nose is one of the most obvious places in my mind. So the lower third of the nose is particularly risky. I think high volume injections, you know, once you're putting over half a mil in to try and get a nose to be the shape you want to, you, you might be making that difference. But is it at what cost? How much? You, you need to really be thinking about the amount of force that is required to do that lifting. Now, so, some noses are highly mobile. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things that suggests you check while others are. Um, they just feel more fixed. 
And if you're trying to lift something that's fixed and you're putting more product in, you're going to be increasing the pressure. So that would be a risk uh, in particular. Um, I think high G prime products will be more risky because it's just they just have the ability to exert more force because they're stronger. So what would you what would you use if you were doing a tip? Well, I, I do use a fairly high G prime product for tips because I'm trying to shape something, but I'm also using that more analog component of how much how much space do I feel there actually is to inject. Um, it's particularly more in the Glabella, I think the high G, high G Prime products would be a risk. So what we need to understand as injectors is the anatomy in terms of layers. So we need to be able to place structures relative to each other in our mind's eye. At the top, of course, we have the dermis. Then we have a layer of hypodermic fat. Then we have the orbicularis oris muscle. And then underneath that, the submucosa, and finally the mucosal layer forming the lip envelope. The muscle inserts into the vermilion border where the divide between the mucosa and the dermis is. And this is a very useful landmark to reference the likely position of the artery because it's so clear for all of us to see when we're injecting. In this paper, they studied 193 cadavers, which is a very big study by aesthetic standards. And they dissected at three different points along the top and three different points along the bottom of the lip and then look to identify the position of the artery relative to the muscle and the probability of that changing as the artery traverses across the lips. They established that there are three layers in which we might find the artery, sandwiched between the oral mucosa and the muscle, within the muscle itself, or above the muscle in the hypodermis. The paper found that 78% were posterior to the muscle, 17% were intramuscular, and 2% were in the hypodermis. Around 30% of the specimens showed the vessels actually crossing into different layers in the same cadaver. It's also reported that the superior labial artery tended to run exactly where we inject with many techniques, at the level of the vermilion border. The inferior labial artery was found to be inferior to the vermilion border, at least that's on our side. And then there were around 2% of cases where the same lip had arteries in more than one plane, usually both the subcutaneous and the submucosal. The difficulty I believe is that in order to apply this to your actual injection technique, you have to have three dimensions of anatomy in your mind simultaneously. It's no good just looking at it in a single plane at the point of injection. So of course, first along the Y axis, we know that the artery runs from lateral to medial on both the superior and the inferior side. Along the X axis, the depth of the artery, we have an excellent guide from this and other papers that the artery is usually beneath the muscle in the majority of cases. The depth of the artery ranges from three to seven millimeters, depending on the paper that you read. But one of the greatest limitations of cadaver studies is that, as we know, cadavers do not represent our patient cohort, thankfully, especially when it comes to the lips, because we are mainly treating younger females in our clinic and most cadavers are very old and have lost a lot of volume. I believe that the depth of the artery is likely to be significantly different as we lose volume. And this could account for some of the discrepancy in the descriptions found in the published data. The first thing to think about is, uh, yes, of course, the fundamental is blocked blood vessel, not getting oxygen to the tissues, but you can break this down in many different kind of versions of that same event. So the most simple of all would be a point occlusion. So if you imagine the facial artery and you inject 0.1 mils of filler in it or 0.05, small amount that blocks just one section, not in a point where it's connected with any other vessels, what would that actually do to the skin? And it's in that imagining of how does that actually play out that you start to see how these things would present differently and perhaps how the treatment will be different. So in that particular occasion, if you talk to many plastic surgeons, they will tell you that they quite often will ligate vessels. I remember talking to a nose surgeon who told me that they ligate the columella artery, completely tie it off and then don't untie it in all surgeries. And the, the nose does not necrose. The nose does not necrose. The nose does not necrose. And that tells you a lot about how the vascular system really works, which is, it's not as simple as, uh, you know, if you picture a tree, it's not like tying, shutting off the supply of one branch to the nutrients from the roots. Um, those, the, the connections are actually more complicated than that. So although they separate at the trunk level, they actually then rejoin higher up and the capillaries are all connected and they're all, the capillary units, which are the, the subunits, the arteriosomes of the skin are also connected via little vessels 
that sometimes can open and sometimes can close depending on the situation that they're in. Uh, and all of this makes everything a lot more complex to try and understand. Uh, but most of it is good because there are defense mechanisms against occlusions which will hopefully keep some of the skin alive and, uh, and that actually makes things a bit easier for us. So most important, I think, with the if you think of that point occlusion, which I started out with, is that most of the connections in the face, most of the arteries will be connected with the other arteries through some mechanism. They're just, uh, I guess, obviously, the further and further away, the, the more the more difficult it is for for that for the blood to flow. But you do get anastomoses, and you do get connections that allow some oxygen to reach tissues, even though you may have blocked some of a uh, of an artery. So, what are the other versions of occlusion? Uh, well, let's br branch out from that initial version. So the, the point occlusion, if you just imagine injecting more into that same space, what's going to happen is you're going to continuously occlude more and more of that vessel and then some of the tributaries coming off it. So you could maybe use the example of the superior labial artery becoming occluded and then branching off into the columella artery. So you get blockage of all those vessels, but it's also the little tiny vessels branching off from those named arteries that become occluded. Uh, and that, that is instantly more comprehensive because there's no way for it to get around. It's not a point, it's a whole section that gets blocked off. And there will be some support, but probably not enough support in most cases for that tissue to be alive. So you've blocked off a significant artery with all the branches from that artery. And that is a much more um, comprehensive blockade of the important oxygen uh, not being able to get through. So in this second version of the VO, which is more comprehensive, what, how would we know? What would we see? So these are the more common ones that you see where you can actually see the anatomy underneath. So it may start with a small area of discoloration and then you see it develop over time. So, you know, the, the big ones are you can actually see the path of the facial artery. Sometimes it goes all the way up into the supertrochlear artery. So you see that whole network of blood vessels all occluded on just one side. Um, and these tend to therefore go with larger injections. So they tend to be bolus injections. Sometimes it's a cannula that stayed in one place for a while, um, but they're certainly higher volume um, because there's more product in the vessel and it's flowing out more. I think probably with the previous version, if you get a little bit of product into a vessel, you don't always even see the occlusion. And maybe those are the ones that are responsible for the emboli that come later when that little point occlusion of filler moves its way into a more end arter artery type structure um, and then you get a patch that develops later on i think it's much rarer but th those are the two the two different ways it'll play out um, so much larger volumes and th and that is why you see um, it affects so much more of an area and be more comprehensive so it's i don't think you could possibly achieve that with a tiny amount mm -hmm.